So um, I am just so thrilled to introduce to you our, our next set of speakers. Um, so this is going to be all about medical school and the experiences that you can expect if you would like to become a physician. So um, our, our first speakers are, are Alexis Cristiano. She is a second year medical student at California North State College of Medicine. Again, that is a local school here in Elk Grove. And then we have Angelica Martin, and she is a third year medical student at the UC Davis School of Medicine. And then finally, a dear friend to the Medical Society, I've done an awful lot of work with her, Dr. Rochelle Frank. Uh, she is an associate professor of neurology at California North State College of Medicine. Uh, there will be time for questions after all the panelists speak. And at the end of this session, we again have another uh, fun activity for you. And as a reminder, just throw your questions in the chat, or if you feel like talking, raise your virtual hand. I'm happy to call on you. All right, so let's get started. I, I forget which one of the speakers is first, but I imagine you know, I think it's Alexis, is that right? Are you first? Yeah, I it can is. go first. All right, good. All right, okay. Alexis, you're up. Hi everyone. So my name, like she mentioned, is Alexis Cristiano. I'm about to start my second year of medical school uh, this coming July. So I'm very excited about that. But I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about my personal pathway to medicine. And something I just want to emphasize to start is that everyone's pathway is super unique. So no two people that I know ended up in the same place with the same exact path. So no matter what you want to do or um, what you want to end up being, just the path that you take to get there can be unique to you and just keep that in mind. So this was my experience, but this isn't something that everybody has to do. Um, so I would say my journey to medicine started when I was about in eighth grade. And so I grew up as a competitive horseback rider. And for most of my life, that was what I thought I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I was planning on becoming a professional trainer and riding horses for the rest of my life. And um, when I was in eighth grade, uh, my dad actually ended up having a heart attack and had to get a quadruple bypass open heart surgery, which was like a very big thing in my family. And it kind of caused uh, a huge change in my life. And so after that point, um, my father, who was previously healthy, he was a bodybuilder, he was in great shape. Um, I realized that health it can, is so much more than just how you're feeling or what you put into your body. There's other things that go into it, like your genetics, uh, your environment, things like that. And so I kind of got really interested after that point in genetics. So why was my dad sick, even though he was so healthy on the outside and he took great care of himself? And so I got really into looking up things about like the genetic factors of heart disease and um, so that was something I kind of had in the back of my mind, like this is something that I find interesting and it's something that obviously has had a huge impact on my personal life. And when I went to high school, um, I had a good idea that I wanted to go into medicine. Um, I wasn't sure exactly what type of field I would want to go into, but I was lucky enough to take a class in high school uh, that my school offered, which was called Principles of Biomedical Science. And that class was basically structured where we came in on the first week of school and there was like a dead fake person on the ground. So it was like a, a dummy basically. And they were dead on the ground. There was like a spilled pill bottle and like fake throw up. And the whole class the entire year was going through her medical problems and um, seeing like what contributed to her ultimate death. And so we learned about things like diabetes, high blood pressure, anemia, things like that. And I found that really interesting and it definitely pursued or definitely influenced my pursuit for medicine. And one of the things we had to do in that class was shadow a, a health professional. And I was super shy growing up. I didn't want to have to reach out and ask people if I could shadow them. Um, I hate asking people for favors. So having to go to someone that was a doctor and be like, can I please shadow you for six hours? That was horrifying to me, but I ended up doing it. I saved it till almost the end of the year. And I ended up being able to shadow a neurosurgeon for a week um, at one of the hospitals by my parents' house. And during that time, I was able to go to a um, 
oncology, a neuro-oncology conference and sit with other doctors and uh, radiologists and pathologists and look at different patient cases and figure out like the best way to uh, continue the treatment with each patient. And I really liked watching the doctors work together. That was like very cool to me. I did, that wasn't something I really thought happened. So seeing, you know, like six, seven doctors in the room working together to figure out the best plan for a patient, I thought that was really amazing. Um, and the other thing I got to do there was watch two surgeries. And so my first surgery I did, um, I snuck into a, not snuck in, but I was, I was uh, brought in by the neurosurgeon into a gallbladder removal surgery. Uh, which was interesting, a little bit gnarly looking, but uh, it was pretty cool. And then the second one I got to do was a lumbar spinal fusion. And so that was a, a pretty big surgery. And it was pretty crazy to my high school mind that that was something that uh, people have to get done because it is such an intense surgery. And what I was able to do there was I actually got to stand on a stool behind the surgeon's back. So I was like peeking over their shoulder, watching them do the whole surgery. And it was just so cool. And um, I did almost pass out once, but um, I saved myself. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I didn't embarrass myself, but um, it was super, super cool. And I think there was a question, how old were you when you shouted? I was 18 by that point. So um, that was the end of my senior year in high school. And so I was 18 when I was started shadowing. Um, but after that, I ended up applying to college. I wanted to stay relatively locally um, because I grew up in the East Bay area. And so I ended up getting into Davis. And so I went to UC Davis. Um, I kind of jumped around majors a little bit, which uh, at, at least at the UCs is pretty easy. So I applied as a biochem major because I thought I was going into pre-med. That's probably what I should be doing, some type of science. And then I realized I wasn't super into the upper division classes for biochem. And so I switched to evolution and ecology because I liked the kind of evolution aspects that kind of tied in the genetics. And I thought it was super interesting. And then I changed to genetics. My, beginning of my third year, I switched to genetics and I, that was kind of my happy spot. And it kind of tied in the things that I really enjoyed about science, which was some math stuff, but also just uh, talking about genetics, which with my background with my dad and how he just has a, a genetic heart issue, um, that was something that I really enjoyed learning about. And I could, I felt like sitting in those classes, I was also learning a bit more about myself um, as a human made up of millions of genes. So um, I really enjoyed my time at UC Davis. Um, I ended up graduating in the winter of, I guess, December of 2018. Um, and I graduated from college a little bit early, uh, technically like two quarters early, but um, that's just because I took summer classes. And so uh, one of the things that I really wanted to be at college is that I carved out enough time to dedicate to doing other things I needed to do to prepare for medical school and not have to focus on doing all those things while I was still in college. And so what I did was I graduated in December and one of the things you have to do to get into medical school is take the MCAT. And so I graduated in December and I decided to take my MCAT that next April. And so that was able to give me four solid months where I wasn't working, I wasn't um, studying for other classes. I could just dedicate to studying for the MCAT. And that's probably one of the biggest factors of getting into medical school is your MCAT score, your GPA, and then your extracurriculars. And so having that time to dedicate to studying for the MCAT instead of having to worry about studying on top of my other classes that I was already stressed enough about, uh, that was a really good, I think that was a really good decision in retrospect for me um, to be able to have that time just to sit down and focus on one thing and able to accomplish that in the end. Um, and I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what I did while in college to, um, I guess, prepare myself for medical school. I see we have a couple questions, so let me address those really quick. Was it hard for you to get into UC Davis? Yeah, I think every college is, is hard to get into, especially the UCs. Um, oh, there's a lot coming in. Um, what was your GPA when you graduated from high school? My GPA was an unweighted 4.0. 
a weighted 4.3, I think. I took some honors classes and a couple APs my senior year, but um, I had a pretty good GPA. Uh, and it is hard to get into these UCs. You do have to have good grades. You have to have good uh, standardized test scores and you have to have things that you're passionate about outside of school to really show that you're not just a, uh, a studying machine. You're also a human that has hobbies and um, other things that you're passionate about. And like I mentioned to you guys before, I'm actually at a barn right now because that's where I work right now. And so I've been doing that for a long time. And that was a big part of my application was discussing like what I've learned from horseback riding and the experiences I've gotten from there. Um, so when I was in college, I, my first year, I mostly just spent kind of getting used to like the adjustment to college, which is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty big adjustment, but um, I, during my second year, I applied for a volunteer position, which is through UC Davis. And what they have is like a, a hospital program where you are able to apply for the hospital volunteer, and then you get to go in into the hospital and um, be able to shadow or just do small things. Like I was in the CAT scan and radiology department. And so what I did was I transported patients um, from the ER to the CT scan room. And uh, I also did, so I did that for four months. And then I also did the uh, pediatric department. And so that was kind of like, uh, hanging out with some of the kids that were hospitalized and I got to play games with them. Um, sometimes I, the babies, I got to hold babies and help feed them, stuff like that. And so that was a super good experience for me to be able to get into a hospital and actually see like, uh, what the doctors are actually doing and get patient interaction. And that was a huge part of my application to medical school too, because I, um, having that hands-on experience and actually working with patients is a really valuable skill. And another thing I did while in college was I uh, volunteered in a high school biology classroom. And that was really, really fun. It actually almost made me think about, do I wanna do teaching in high school or do I wanna be a doctor? And I ended up choosing being a doctor, but um, I really, really enjoyed helping students teaching. Um, I did biology and chemistry. And that was a super, super fun experience for me. So I did that once a week. You're the first person in your family who has graduated from pharmacy. So I'm going into medical school. So that's an MD degree, but I don't have any family members in the medical field. No pharmacists, no doctors, no nurses, nothing like that. So it was a little bit left field for my whole family, but it was very supportive. Um, so after I graduated from college, I ended up um, studying for the MCAT. And most of what I do for studying for the MCAT was just book based. And so you can buy like the big study guides. And so every single day I'd go through for about five hours and take notes on the big sections and then do practice questions. That's kind of the main gist of my studying, but you just have to spend a lot of hours preparing for that. And uh, if you guys have other questions, I can talk about that later. Um, but another thing I did was after I took the MCAT, I applied for a job in a doctor's office and I was a medical scribe. And so I worked full time in the internal medicine office. Uh, most of our patients were elderly, first-generation Chinese immigrants. And that was a population that I personally didn't have a lot of experience with. And so getting into the office, I was with the doctor for every single patient that we saw. And so I took vitals. I took all of the encounter notes. I helped prescribe medication. I did medication refills. I assisted with small procedures. Um, I was also kind of a secretary. I, I did everything basically. And that was such a good experience because I felt more prepared going into medical school because I had already had a lot of experience with the different diseases, the different medications that people get for certain diseases, different blood tests. What did the blood tests mean? Um, what's the kind of standard treatment for certain conditions that someone might be having? And I definitely had a little one up on some of my uh, peers in medical school because I already knew what a lot of the medications were that we were learning about. And that did give me a bit of an advantage because uh, learning the pharmacology in, in medical school is one of the more challenging parts, I think. Um, but yeah, and so in 2019, I applied for medical school and I ended up applying to 29 schools. And that probably seems like a ton, but I think like 20 to 30 is usually pretty average. Um, and from that, I ended up getting three interviews 
And from those three interviews, I got two acceptances, one of which was to uh, Cal North State. And it was really important to me to be um, in kind of the relative area of my family, just because I am super close to my family. And I wanted to be close because like I mentioned to you guys, my dad does have a, a heart issue. Um, and so in case of emergency, it was really important for me to be close. And I was super glad I was close because my dad actually had a heart attack a few weeks ago during my finals week of medical school. And so being able to just run back really quick and just check in with him and make sure he was okay it meant a lot for me to be able to be there. Um, and so I got into CNU. And so part of the part of the application process, which you guys might have um, learned a little bit about, but you have to do a initial application, you do a secondary application, and then you do your interview. And so it's about a year process to actually do. And um, it's a very long process. And so during that whole thing, I was working in the doctor's office. And so I was keeping busy, but um, I ended up choosing to go to CNU and I, I'm really happy with that decision because I've really enjoyed my time there so far, even with COVID, it was a little bit, uh, a little bit different than the typical experience, but um, I really enjoyed all my professors. Dr. Frank was one of my professors and you'll hear from her later, but um, so I got to learn a lot from her this year too. And it's just been a really good experience overall for me. Um, and I'm really happy I chose this. So in terms of moving forward, so I'm in my second year, I have two more years of school and then I go apply for residency. And so my hope right now is to do something either in family medicine, which is a like, type of primary care. So you do everything from babies up into elderly patients, or I might do pediatrics too, but I do want to stick in primary care um, because I do really like being able to see my patients often and kind of be a part of the process all the way through. But yeah, so I'm gonna check and see if there's any other questions. What science classes did you take when you were in high school? Um, I did biology, chemistry, anatomy, um, principles of biomedical science for my four years. I didn't do any AP science classes, though I kind of wish I did because that would have been really good preparation for college classes. Like I mentioned, CNU is in Elk Grove. Um, it is an Elk Grove and it is in the process of being accredited. It is in, I believe, in one of the final steps. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so being a scribe is, a, is such a good first step and I would recommend it to anyone. Um, you can either be a scribe in a hospital, you can be a scribe in like a private practice setting. All of those are going to be really, really good experiences for you. Especially if you go into, if you have an idea of like a specialty you're interested in, being a scribe in that specialty would be a super great experience. Um, gee, I answered that one. In terms of studying for the MCAT, I think everybody has methods that are going to be more productive for them. Um, for me, I'm a, a note taker. And so just reading through and taking notes was the best way for me to do it and reviewing my notes. But a lot of people like to use flashcard. Um, flashcards like Anki, which is an online flashcard service that people use in medical school too. And some people really like that for MCAT studying. Um, I don't know when CNU will be fully accredited, but maybe Dr. Frank knows. Uh, would you recommend taking a lot of AP classes even though it may harm your weighted GPA? Uh, I would, I would recommend that. I think, uh, I think going through the challenges in your high school experience is good. I think getting good study habits in your high school experience is good. And I do want to emphasize, like, even if you don't get into the school you want for undergrad, um, maybe your GPA suffered a little bit, community college is an amazing option, amazing option. And I didn't do it, but I decided beforehand that if I didn't get into UC Davis, I would go to community college and then transfer um, because it really does save you so much money in the long run and you still graduate with the same same degree, basically, from the school as someone that went to a four-year college versus someone that went to community college and saved money the whole process. And yeah, thank you guys. I hope, you, I hope that was helpful somewhat. I think I'm out of time, yeah. Yes, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much, Alexis. That was wonderful. So um, now we're going to go over to Angelica um, who is at UC Davis. So Angelica, take it away. 
Thank you. Thanks, uh, Alexis, for, you know, getting those uh, high school classes questions out of the way and everything. I'm happy to answer any of those as well. Um, so my name is Angelica or Angelica, whichever one is, is fine with me. I switch between them depending on the day and, you know, my mood and everything. Um, but I, a little bit about me. Um, so I'm a third year medical student, which basically means that I'm like a junior, um, if there's any juniors, you know, in high school out there. Um, so I still have this year and then one more year left. And um, going back to my process in terms of getting to where I am today, it's been really long. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a single parent immigrant household in LA. So my dad was killed when I was three years old. So I only grew up with my mom, my older sister and my younger brother. Um, so growing up, I was very independent because I had to be, you know, like I was in survival mode. My family was in survival mode. So um, I, my family and I relied on all social services. So uh, EBT or food stamps, Medi-Cal, um, welfare, anything like that. Um, you know, we were on it and using it and that's how we got through day to day. And I really um, value that experience because it really shapes my perception of the medical field and my perception of higher education as well. And it made me more resilient overall, you know, knowing that um, I, well, I didn't know about my socioeconomic status growing up. I was just like, yeah, everyone's on food stamps, you know, like whatever, it's fine. Um, because it really doesn't matter. You just keep doing what you have to do. And, you know, you keep taking the classes that you have to take and all that. Um, but Anyway, so Echo Park is the community that I grew up in. It's pretty, it, growing up, it was pretty dangerous. Uh, lots of gangs. My high school was overcrowded. There were 5,000 people in my high school and my class itself was 500 people. And um, unfortunately, only 4% of my high school graduating class was going to college. Just to give you an idea of um, the expectations or, that were or weren't placed on me. Um, I didn't know that I had to go to college uh, to become a doctor. And uh, I found out when I was in freshman year of high school and they made us do a project thinking about what college we might want to go to. And I was like, wait, what is this? What is going on? Um, funnily enough, I ended up choosing UC Davis as my school project. At the time I wanted to be a veterinarian and uh, UC Davis has a great vet school. So I just Googled, um, you know, on dial up internet, I just Googled uh, best vet school in the world and UC Davis was right there. And I'm like, oh, perfect. It's in California, it's fine. So um, that's how I found out that, you know, you have to go to college and everything to, to get a higher education degree and to become a veterinarian. Um, like I said, my family didn't have a lot of money growing up. So I was actually in band in high school, all four years, marching band, jazz band. I was a complete band geek. Um, and my high school band teacher knew about my family situation. He was extremely involved in all of his students' lives. And he's like, hey, Angelica, um, so I have a teacher's aid position open for you if you have any time during you know your vacation time we'll pay you to like just come and help out with the music writing class and I'm like yeah sure whatever it's fine um so I ended up doing being a teacher's assistant in high school and there was a class of uh, special needs kids and that completely changed my career trajectory I you know was involved with their their teaching during this one period and I'm just like wait why am I going to be working with animals when I have people in my community human beings right in front of me who need help so I thought I was going to go into research and find a cure of course big dreams um, I was going to find a cure for down syndrome <laughs> and um, they told me when I told my, my high school college counselor, I was really close to him. Um, when I told him that I wanted to do this, he's like, Angelica, you know that means you have to be in a lab and you don't really have the personality for that. Like you're more outwardly and you people person. So maybe think about something else. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'll just be a doctor then. So that means I have to go to college <laughs> and I have to do all these things. Um, and I really liked the question earlier about what high school classes you took. Um, or science classes you took in high school, because in my school, we were so overcrowded that we didn't really have a say in what high school college, I mean, high school science classes we took. 
you were put in a class because there was space. And throughout high school, I had to really advocate for myself. I looked up the California A through G requirements, which are basically like a list of classes that colleges look on your transcript to make sure that you have. And I um, printed it out and I made sure, okay, am I, you know, this year, did I take this, the, bio, the first biology class? Yes, check. Okay, well, they put me in art class, which doesn't make any sense. I don't need another art class. I already fulfilled that requirement. So I, I actually had to really, really, really advocate for myself throughout high school to make sure that I fulfilled all of those requirements. And I highly recommend if you can just Google California A through G requirements or you know, just um, college requirement, college entrance requirements, and you print that out for yourself to make sure that you're taking the right classes. Um, so I did that, and that also speaks to the environment in my high school. There was just a lot of people there. Um, and another thing that happened for me was because I was so involved in band, right? Um, Alexis was talking about how they want to see what else you're interested in. And, you know, who are you as a person? Um, so band was basically the big portion of my college application because it was a big portion of who I am. To this day, music, um, I'm a jazz musician. So music is still like a big portion of who I am. And so much so that it was actually my high school band teacher who drove me to take the SATs. I had a band competition in Santa Barbara that morning. And I'm like, hey, this is, you know, like conflicting. And I was the lead sax player. So they, it's not like they could compete without me. Um, so my band teacher woke up at 4 a.m., went to pick me up and drove me to Santa Barbara High School where I took the SATs, immediately finished and ran to perform for the competition. Um, but it's just, you know, there, there's all these things that if you don't grow up with that structure or you don't grow up in an environment that has that supportive structure, it's so important for you to uh, plan ahead of time and to have that support network, reach out for help. Um, so I was able to do that with my band teachers and, um, you know, I was able to talk about that experience in my college applications as well. Um, so another thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of high school and the transition to college, I actually ended up going to college in Boston. Um, so I went from LA all the way to Massachusetts on the other side of the country. Um, and the reason for this is because there's the UC system is great, and obviously I'm in the UC system right now, um, but there's small private schools as well. I went to Wellesley College, and I wanted, coming from a 5,000 person high school, I wanted smaller classrooms. Um, so Wellesley had, you know, 12 people to a classroom, and I'm like, wow, that's exactly what I want. Not only that, but um, sometimes these colleges, at least for me, money has always been a big factor in my decisions and my next steps. And, um, you know, as a, uh, Wellesley as a private institution had the financial needs to support me. So finances weren't really a decision maker for me because um, Wellesley was able to give me a scholarship for that. So I highly encourage everyone to not only look at the UCs, um, but also branch out, see what other schools are out there. Small private schools sometimes have more resources to give to students, especially if you come from a background like myself, um, you know, low income, low socioeconomic status, really uh, go getter and, you know, just want to do something, right? Um, so highly recommend you do that. Uh, and so I went to school in Boston and at Wellesley, I was a biology and women's and gender studies major. Um, you have to take all these classes, pre-med classes, and you have to, you know, think about your extracurriculars and all that stuff. So I kind of went into this pre-med mode of preparing for medical school. Um, at the same time, you know, once again, I had to find a way to pay for my flights back home. So even though my tuition was paid for, I, I still wanted to see my family. And also the, the college campus was closed over the summer. So it's not like if I could stay in the dorms. Um, so I think that that's also a factor that sometimes people don't realize. Um, so I 
definitely um, worked during Wellesley. I was a research assistant. Um, and then after Wellesley, I ended up doing a couple of other jobs. I was a babysitter <laughs> for sure. Babysitter uh, job was great. Um, and, you know, it really helped develop uh, a lot of different skill sets for me. Um, I then worked for five years before, um, for four years before doing what's called a post back program, which is basically saying, going back to college and just doing science classes to show the medical schools like, hey, I've been out of school for a while because I've been working, but I can still do science. I still remember all the biology and all that stuff. So please accept me. Um, so I did that at UC Davis. And then uh, I went back to work for another year because the whole application process is a year. And then um, now I'm in medical school. So I just wanted to really focus on my upbringing and my high school experience because um, it's uh, important to realize that if you come from a background like myself, that it's great if you can plan ahead. Where do you see yourself? And that's exactly why I'm here. Do you see yourself as a third year medical student, you know, having gone through all this, um, someone's asking how many years it took to get to the place I am now in total. Let's see. So it was high school's four years. And then I immediately went to uh, college, which was four years. I graduated on time and everything. Um, and then I did a master's degree, which is basically just more schooling. Um, so I, that took two years. I have a master's in public health. And then after public health school, so that's 10 years already, um, after public health school, I worked for five years, um, or I had a gap year for five years. So that's another five, so that's 15. And then um, I am currently in my third year, so that's 18. But if you take out high school, then that's 11, right? Or am I doing my, the math right? <laughs> 14, 14, 14. Um, so it's... It's been long, but every step of the way had its purpose. So for me, um, getting my uh, master's in public health meant that I was learning about all of the resources that my family used growing up. And that was so important to me because as a doctor, I want to be able to say, hey, I know about food stamps because I've been on them and I learned about the system. I've worked with the system. Let me answer any of the questions that you have. Or I can turn around and be like, this isn't working for my patients. How can I help fix this? Knowing the system as having used it, as having applied, as having helped my patients apply, how can I fix this for future generations so that they don't have to go through what my family went through? Because growing up, I was, you know, a little eight-year-old learning how to speak English because Spanish was actually my first language, um, learning how to speak English and helping my mom fill out the forms, um, you know? So it's like, how can we help make this better? So uh, that was the purpose of my master's in public health. And then working in the field, um, I actually worked in health policy, which basically means that I um, helped make the health laws uh, better. So if you've heard about Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, you know, just making sure that those laws actually help people and help my future patients, help my family, help my community, other communities that look like it. Um, that was also very important to me. And now as a doctor or as a future doctor, I can say, hey, this law isn't working anymore. How can we change it to make it better, to actually do what it was supposed to do? Um, so that was you know, that, that played that role um, as well. When I went to college, I was a biology uh, major and a women's and gender studies major. Just because uh, biology, I always liked animals. I wanted to be a vet. Um, and also um, women's and gender studies at my school at Wellesley, um, I was able to focus on public health. So that's actually where I learned, wait, public health is a, is a field. It, it's it's looking at, do people have access to the food that we're telling them to eat, you know, healthy food? Do they have access to education, right? Like looking at my school, did we have access to all the resources that we needed? No, our textbooks were like breaking apart. <laughs> so like we could fix that, you know? Um, so that's how I was introduced to public health in the first place. Um, 
So, oh, health policies tomorrow session. That's great. Um, so I just, I always like to share my story because I feel like um, my humble upbringing still very much influenced what I'm doing, what I want to do, um, what I've done. And I want to show people that, you know, people that come from my background can be a doctor. And in fact, we can be great doctors, not even just normal doctors, because communities like the one that I come from need excellent doctors, not just doctors. Um, so I highly encourage anyone who's thinking about becoming a doctor to just, you know, make a plan, uh, try to get some help. It's okay if life doesn't go how you think it's going to, because I was expecting to already be a doctor by this point. Um, but it, I learned so much from where I was um, at at each point in my career so far. Um, yeah, exactly. So my mom, yeah, she, uh, my mom was, is an immigrant. Um, she's now a US citizen, but it's, it's important to have our voice at the table and to have this um, reflection about where we come from and never lose touch with where we come from. I think that that's important for me um, to make sure that we are continuing um, the consciousness of um, improving our healthcare system. Um, happy to answer any more questions about what classes I took in college. Um, highly encourage all of you, please become friends with your high school college counselors. They have access to um, scholarships that literally when I was in high school, they were like, hey, no one has applied to the scholarship, Angelica. It's an essay, write it. And I was like, okay, sure. And then here you go, $500. Um, also, there's the, I'm a Bill Melinda Gates scholar, which basically paid for my college. There's still that scholarship out there. So I'll Google it um, and highly encourage you to apply to that as well. And look at all schools that you can think of. Some of them have flyaway programs is what they call them. And they will fly you to their school and try to like be like, hey, this is a great school for you, come over. Um, more than anything during college, I highly encourage you to focus on your classes. Your classes, there was a question about how you prepared for the MCAT. Your science classes are your foundation for studying for the MCAT. Um, your science teachers are the ones who are gonna be writing you recommendation letters. Um, so it's all about planning, right? So just make sure that you get all of that down and uh, reach out for help. There's one more question in here for you, Angelica. Would you suggest still trying to go to med school even if you're not 100% sure about whether you have the drive to do it? Everyone has the drive to do it if they want to do it, <laughs> for sure. Um, no one that is in med school is smarter than you or anything that you don't have. Um, if you want to become a doctor, if you think you want to be in this position here, all you have to do is work for it. Um, you do have to be smart in terms of like planning ahead, especially if you don't have the resources like I didn't. Um, and you know, just like maybe saving up for the summer so you can take uh, a couple months off to study for the MCAT and stuff like that. And it's very, very scary. And I, I just want to say that it was very scary for me a lot of the times, but most of the time when I was about to do something, I thought of it as like, I'm betting on myself. You know, like I am betting that I will make a great doctor and I have to put in the work to actually do this. One way that you can find out if you want to become a doctor or not is shadowing like Alexis was saying. Um, so really uh, because you're connected through SSBMS, the organization that put this together, they can connect you to some physicians. Um, when you're in college, there's a bunch of pre-med student groups that you can get involved in and they're connected to physicians. Um, you just need one physician to be connected to because if they don't have what you are looking for, they can easily call their 10 other doctor friends and say, hey, this, you know, Angelica is interested in um, this type of care or whatever. Uh, can you let her shadow you for, you know, a day or whatever like that? And that's how you get the feel for whether or not you want to do that. Um, I volunteered in the hospital when I was in high school. I volunteered at, um, in the emergency room and that was eye opening. I didn't do anything other than check people in because, you know, I'm, I was only 17, but I spoke Spanish 
And guess what? I can talk to patients all day long. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a way that you can find out whether or not you want to go into medicine, but no one has something that you don't. And that's how they became a doctor. I mean, it, anyone can become a doctor. Um, it's just about planning and keeping at it, not letting any problems that arise get you off track. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Dr. Frank, you're up next for the, the next 10 minutes or so. Guys, if you have questions, keep putting them in the chat. We'll try to get to them all at the end. Well, thank you, Angelica and, and Alex. Those were amazing stories and really appreciate you sharing them, really inspiring. And um, I do think the theme of, you know, really looking at what you want and that you can go for it. I'll tell you a little about my story. Um, and uh, I would just say that um, I don't know when I started thinking of medicine. It certainly, uh, it, in my family, no one had been a doctor, although I was fortunate. I mean, I was definitely gonna go to college and I had that kind of background that people, so it's really amazing to hear um, how, how people can do it without that. And how like that was really cool. Um, so, uh, so I uh, thought about, uh, I, I went back, I actually had forgotten all this, but I went back um, when I applied to medical school and realized in my high school essay to college that I said that I wanted to be a neuroscientist and probably a medical researcher and go and get an MD and you know be a physician and a researcher. That's what I thought at that time. Uh, when I started uh, college, I was at UC Berkeley and frankly, I, didn't really like hanging out with the pre-meds. And I really just said, I don't think that's what I want to do. Uh, so I became a physics major and I uh, really liked the pursuit of science. I was really excited about it. Um, by my third year, I realized that I still wanted to be working with people more than I would as a, you know, a scientist like that. And, um, you know, I was in Berkeley in the mid eighties in college. So, um, at that point, there really still was not like a neuroscience or certainly wasn't cognitive science and things like that. So I, um, I looked and I said, you know, I really thought I was going to go into neuroscience and like go into biophysics and neuroscience in graduate school, that kind of thing. And I said, you know, I think I do want to be a physician. It's really funny because the physics majors, and this was not a time that STEM was so lucrative as it is now, you know, it's like, I'm selling out, I'm taking the easy way out. It's kind of funny to think of that, but that's what physics majors think of physicians. So anyway, and, and my son's a physics major and I don't think that's changed so much. Um, so anyway, I, um, I ended up uh, going into majoring in biophysics because I liked the courses that I could take better my senior year and graduating on time and then taking an extra year working. I actually worked at Children's Hospital in LA, so not far from Echo Park, um, uh, uh, as a researcher for a year. And um, I will share something personal. The, um, the same uh, week that I got into my first choice for medical school, which was UC San Diego, I uh, found out that I was pregnant. And um, I will say that, that uh, it, it does let you know the best laid plans you cannot count on, even if you're a responsible person. So do know that message that things can happen that you are unexpected. Uh, but it worked out well. And um, I deferred a year. I got into UC San Diego. I requested a year deferral. They did give it to me. And uh, I started medical school with a 10 month old. And I was the only mother. There were a few fathers. And there might have been one, there was one other mother by the end of the time I was there. And it really was not, uh, it was something I had to deal with because people really uh, were asking, you know, like, you know, when I was in uh, groups with my, my husband and I were, you know, we were working with other married students that had kids and um, they would say things like, uh, you know, what do you do with your daughter during the day? Because at that point it wasn't really okay to, to leave her in daycare and whatever. So, you know, I, I, I dealt with all that el element of things. And I, I think luckily that's not as much an issue for you guys. Um, Cause you saw that people can turn out pretty well. And my kids turned out well, even though I was a physician. <laughs> so just say that. Um, so I went to medical school. I was pretty clear I wanted to be a neurologist, you know, from before medicine. 
And I would say that uh, I thought about psych and a couple of things, but really nothing swayed that. I really kind of went straight forward. And I will say I've seen everything, especially uh, at, you know now that I'm teaching in medical school from people who know from the get go that they want to do something and do it, people who know, then they change to people who don't know and they figure it out. All of that's fine. I just happen to be one of those people that knew. And again, my path is my path. Um, and I went into neurology. Um, I was pretty clear I wanted to be part-time, which was not really okay back then. And still in neurology is not easy to swing. And I applied, to, I, I basically wrote to all the neurologists in the Northwest. I, I went to a residency in North Carolina. My, my husband got his MPH there and we came back to California after that. I went, um, and um, when I, I was applying, I, I said to people, you know, I really want to work part-time. Could that fit into your practice? And um, I got a couple of people who were interested, but I also applied to some fellowships and I went and uh, did a fellowship at UC Davis. And uh, ultimately I went after that, I worked at Kaiser and I worked at Kaiser for 18 years and I really liked it there. One of the points I would make is that um, my boss that first of all, the part-time, um, I'll tell you a little more. I negotiated 90% at that point when I started. And then when my son was born and the, we, we did have some time points, we thought of having another child, but we didn't have another one until 11, 12 years later and decided to have one. Um, and uh, he, there were almost 11, 12 years between my children, which was interesting, but um, they, I told them I wanna work part-time and I wanna work 60%. And they were like looking at me and uh, they didn't say yes or no for almost six months, um, but they finally said yes. Well, they told me if the person that they plan on coming comes, they told me about four months later that they would let me. Uh, so it worked out and I worked part time. So one of the other things that my uh, boss told me early on in my career there uh, was be sure you do things. You think that clinical work is going to feed you your entire career, but be sure you do other things. So um, I, I would encourage that with whatever you do, that you kind of look at the big picture of your career. And I ended up uh, getting involved in communication. I was a consultant. I worked with uh, physicians on their communication. I taught communication courses and I had a you know, regional work I did with communication as well as wellness. And um, I was on the physician wellness committee and did programs and some of them actually gone regional and even national since then. So I really enjoyed all that a lot. I love Kaiser, I really enjoyed it. But something was clear to me that there was more I wanted to do. And um, I did something that no one does, which was about five years, almost five years ago, I decided to leave Kaiser at a point when people don't, the retirement benefits are so amazing that people sometimes stay just to don't, not leave anything on the table. But I, I came to um, uh, North State and I've been, incredibly happy there, really enjoying teaching. Uh, I teach not only neurology and I'm the clerkship director, but I also uh, do uh, a lot of things that are the other parts of medicine, like communication, wellness, uh, ethics, diversity, all that kind of stuff, and uh, run the wellness committee uh, and get to work uh, with the medical society with Lindsay and Eileen and um, in uh, the uh, joy of medicine, which has been a real joy. So I really enjoyed that as well. Uh, and I've, I've also worked in um, the other thing I picked up in about 2012, so it's, it's getting close to 10 years ago, but I was really interested in mind, body, spirit and how that all goes together in medicine. And I got uh, board certified in integrative medicine. I since have done a more recent board in that, and I now am um, the vice chair of uh, the American Academy of Neurology's um, Neuro Health and Integrative Neurology uh, section. So I've pursued a lot of different things and they, I want to just say all those things are not the, the likely course, like leaving your practice at Kaiser or wanting to be part-time or pursuing integrative medicine. Um, I was working on wellness before wellness became a word. Now it's like a big deal, but it wasn't a big deal when I started. It was kind of uh, not, not, uh, not the end thing, let's just say it that way. So I'm glad to see how much more people care about that issue now. And there are issues I care about, about like spiritual health that I'm, I'm hoping are going to have more and more, because uh, I think that's a very important part of how we are. So anyway, I really want to leave, leave time for questions. Let me make sure there's nothing else. Oh, the only other thing I wanted to mention uh, is being a scribe. 
Uh, this is a theme, but I do want to let you know that I, I'm the clerkship director for neurology and I just did some HPs and I was just thinking about it and noticing that some people are really on top of it. And I've realized that some people are, that have scribed really have the practice and are way ahead when they get to the clinical years. There's no need to do it. Don't ever think, oh, I have to do this. But I will say it's, it's a really good way to do it. You learn a lot about whether you want to be in medicine. You learn a lot of skills you'll use. And I would want to answer that other question. I think anyone who's really interested in medicine and feels it really is their, um, you know, true calling can, can, you know, go through a lot of odds as, as we're hearing, you know, I also would say it takes a lot to be a physician. So, you know, you want to really look. And um, I really think that um, it's very possible. And I really encourage you. For me, it's a way that um, we can be with people in a way we can't in anything else and do all kinds of different things and can't have a say in things like some of the issues that we're talking about for our patients. So I'm going to stop here. I, I know there's been things in the chat and I have no idea what they are um, or if they're related to me or others, but, but thank you. And um, I'm happy to answer anything. Looks like um, they've been answering it via chat, which is great. Thank you, Angelica and Alexis, that's awesome. Um, I don't see any more questions here. If any of you would like to speak up and ask a question, please raise your virtual hand. Um, love to hear from you. And if not, um, we're going to go into our very short activity that we have for you guys. And, um, Angelica will lead us through that, this activity. I don't see any hands up. So Angelica, um, we're gonna go ahead and launch the poll if you'd like to lead the students through it. Yeah, so we have a couple questions for all of you. Um, this idea of like, do I have what it takes to be a doctor? Um, I think that that's, everyone has what it takes, right? So um, here's the first question. This is all information that you might've heard you know, in your classes, or maybe even just like reading, I heard some of these things in like a TV show. Um, so uh, if you know the answers to these, uh, the first one is the vitamin needed for blood, blood clotting is, and you have vitamin K, vitamin B, vitamin A, or vitamin C. And then which of the following groups are all STIs or sexually transmitted infections? There's hepatitis B, hemophilia, AIDS, then AIDS, syphilis, cholera, gonorrhea, hepatitis B, chlamydia, HIV, malaria, trichomoniasis. And then the name of the collarbone, right? This one right here um, is, um, you have acetabulum, the pelvic bone, scapula, or the clavicle. And then the pulmonary vein that carries and pulmonary vein and pulmonary arteries are always a little tricky. So I'm giving you a little hint to think about um, the vein specifically. If it carries the oxygenated blood, meaning it doesn't have oxygen, mixed blood, meaning it has oxygen and blood without oxygen, oxygenated blood, which means that it, it's, it has the oxygen attached to it or pure blood whatever that is. <laughs> and then number five, which part of the brain controls a large part of your ability to see objects? The frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, or occipital lobe? And then the last question is made out of a thin piece of bone. This wall separates nasal passages, basically your nose, right? You have two passages right here. Um, so what is the bone that makes up this wall? The nostrils, cartilage, bridge, or the septum? And um, Lindsay, I don't know. We'll give we everybody about a minute to answer. So it looks like we have um, about 15 that have given their answers so far. Just give them a minute to, to read. If you don't know the answer, yeah. If you don't know the answer to these, that's perfectly fine as well. Just take your biggest guess uh, or your best guess. Uh, in medicine, a lot of it is best guess. <laughs> So that's what we've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, and I think that that's part of the beauty of medicine, right? We have the, even as young, young as we are, we have the opportunity to still uh, change medicine, to still contribute to medicine. Um, so I think that that's all, this also showcases that. <laughs> 
I think one of the other things to mention on that is like, you don't have to feel like you know everything in medicine because it's not possible for everyone to know everything. But the, the cool thing is that in most cases you have colleagues and you have other doctors that you're working with that you can communicate with and run things by them too. And you say, hey, I have a patient that da 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 And you can talk to them too and figure out what maybe what they think they would do. Everyone has their own set of knowledge to bounce these ideas off other people is another really great. Yeah, my friends and I joke around saying that our tests would be easier if we could do a group test. Um, since every single test, one of us knew one fact that the other one didn't. And it's like, oh, I got that other question right though. and not this one, so great. <laughs> it's truly impossible. <laughs> All right, we're giving it uh, 10 more seconds and then we'll end. And then, um, Angelica, if you can go through the answers at that point, that would be great. Yeah. I, I think it's, this is uh, Dr. Williams, I think it's really useful what you were saying about um, taking group tests, though it's not a thing and it may never be. It, it adds to the principle that none of us really stand alone in taking care of a patient. And in an attempt to do that, um, it really increases our stress and it does nothing to truly help the patient. So keep that in the back of your mind and always consider reaching out to someone. We do, none of us have all the answers. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, so I'm just gonna go through the questions. So the vitamin needed for blood clotting is vitamin K. So vitamin K is, um, let me see the, the actual, sorry, script, I have it. Vitamin K is the vitamin that helps with uh, blood clotting, and then there's this medication called warfarin that um, is, it interferes with if you're taking it. So we just wanted to let you know that vitamin K is needed um, to help your blood clot. So when you're bleeding, it helps stop the bleeding. Which of the following groups are all STIs? This one was a little tricky um, because the answer is gonorrhea, hepatitis B, and chlamydia. So hepatitis B, I think that one maybe threw people off, but Good job, everyone, 63% of you. That's great. I don't know if my class could have gotten that one our first year at that rate. Um, we still get tripped up about that, the hepatitis B being a sexually transmitted uh, infection. Um, the name of the collarbone, there we go, 85% right here. That's the clavicle. Um, you will be hearing about people breaking it uh, because they were doing, you know, contact sports, so like football and stuff like that. Um, so that's a good bone to know. It's a great job. Uh, the pulmonary vein carries, good job, oxygenated blood, 63%. Um, so it's a little tricky. Like I said, pulmonary veins and arteries, you have to think about where the blood is going. Is it going to the heart or away from the heart? And that's some of the details that you get into in medical school, just knowing the heart and the lungs and the system that they create and how they relate to one another. Um, which part of the brain controls a large part of your ability to see objects? So this is the occipital lobe, right? So um, the occipital lobe is in the back of the head. So if you maybe like fall down and hit the back of your head, that's how you see, you know, little things in your vision and stuff like little stars in the cartoons. Um, so that's the occipital lobe that relates to us seeing objects. And then the thin piece of bone that separates the nasal passages, the two nasal passages right here. Um, this is called the septum. A lot of people, uh, you know, they have a dislocated septum. So it means that instead of being straight, it's a little bit off and they end up snoring at night. <laughs> and that's just because they have trouble breathing. Um, so that's basically snoring. Um, so great job everyone with 41% on that one as well. But as you can see, these are all questions that like we have to think about as well. We were asked these questions in medical school. Um, even, you know, first year I was definitely asked, well, even a couple months ago, I was asked about the vitamin needed for blood clotting in one of the like major exams that we have to take in medical school. Um, so all of you that got that right, great job. You can be, you know, third year medical students as well. Um, so the whole point of this activity was to show you that these questions are approachable, they're, they're doable, even as high school students without college, I mean, you're already answering these questions. And that just goes to show you that you can just continue learning, maybe look up a couple details if you got one of the questions wrong. And next time that you get it, like you get that same question, you'll get it right. 
Um, and that's, that's the same thing that happens to us as medical students, as physicians. Sometimes you get something wrong, but you just go back and learn so that it doesn't happen again. Um, and so all of you have it in you to become doctors and all of you have it in you to become whatever type of doctor you wanna be and that's further down the line. But thank you very much for giving us your time and for being willing to listen to us in terms of um, encouraging you to join us as doctors for you know the future of medicine and to shape it into what we want it to be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angelica, Alexis, and Dr. Frank.